Welcome to the New Space India podcast, a bi-weekly talk show that brings you exclusive stories from people driving India's space activities. The New Space India podcast is pleased to announce our association with Dassault Systems, a global leader in providing businesses and people with collaborative virtual environments to imagine sustainable innovations. Dassault Systems Solutions supports startups, small and medium scale enterprises and original equipment manufacturers in developing disruptive solutions for space launchers and satellite propulsion. Hi and welcome to yet another episode of the New Space India podcast and today we have here Will Henry who is one of the producers of The High Frontier, the untold story of Gerard O'Neill. Welcome to the show, Will. Thanks for having me. Great. So I had a blast of a time watching this particular documentary whose screener you were very kind in sending me. I would love to hear a little bit about your own background because I saw that you are a producer and, you know, traditionally I have people who are very much into space and deeply into space. Uh, but I also have had previously a friend of mine who is also doing sci-fi and, you know, movie producer doing science fiction based uh, you know, stuff at the end. So would love to hear a little bit about yourself and what got you into Jerry's story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's <laughs> thanks for having me on as well, because I know that you usually have, um, you know, scientists, space guys and, and all that sort of stuff. And I'm glad to be here as a filmmaker and sort of round that out a little bit for you. Yeah. So it's a funny journey to getting to make this film in, in my own career. I, I started out as, as a playwright in New York City, and then I studied the film, and then I went on and on working in Hollywood, and I, I, I left Hollywood to work in a more independent film scene. Um, and then uh, by, uh, by some strand of luck, I ran into um, Dylan Taylor, who is the executive producer and investor of the High Frontier documentary film. Um, and he brought me on to help make this film. And, uh, you know, I say that it was really a team effort to get this film made, but this film would not exist without him. Um, it was his idea to make this film. He is the one who identified that there was this gentleman named Gerard K. O'Neill who wrote the handbook for what, for basically for, for space colonization and what we're now calling today either space migration or space element and all that sort of jargon. Um, but, but basically what's happening today in the new space industry was was set the context, the movements, the, the the policies were set by Gerardo K. O'Neill and his followers back in you know the seventies, the eighties, and the very early nineties. Um, and so, I was brought on to really be more of a logistical producer. I was helping Dylan really just sort of going through the interviews, doing our research, doing some one-on-one -on -one interviews with people around the country he couldn't make uh, time to go see, um, and um, uh, I, I was really there as just a, a helpful arm for the beginning of production. But then there was this strange coincidence. Um, we realized a couple months into making this film, which was that, you know, Gerard O'Neill, uh, just a little bit of background on him. He uh, was a physics professor at Princeton University. He was somewhat uncredited for inventing the particle accelerator. Um, he specifically invented the particle storage ring, which basically made it so that we could study subatomic particles for longer periods of time, um, therefore opening up the door to what is now high energy physics and uh, particle physics. So he being from Princeton was unique to me because I grew up in Princeton. Um, I lived there for about 18 years. And um, while I lived there, I was a filmmaker, of course, um, but I, and I didn't go to Princeton. My father happened to be a chemistry professor, professor there for a very short time. And I was intrigued. And that's actually how Dylan and I crossed paths because I was intrigued on what this project was all about was from there. Um, but the coincidence was that I found out that, you know, by the time uh, I was even born, Gerard O'Neill had passed. Or actually, there was a little bit of crossover there. He passed in 1992. I was born in 91. His widow, Tasha O'Neill, lived in Princeton. And I thought, oh, that's that's pretty cool. I wonder if I knew her. I wonder if I <laughs> lived nearby her or something like that. And turns out she and I were very, very, very close neighbors and were for 15 years. Um, and we never knew each other. Um, and we never knew, uh, uh, you know, that, that we live so close. And, and she sent me a package of some of his old effect of, of Jerry's effects. And I realized, oh, goodness, this film hits home a lot more than I thought. Um, and so we reminisced for a while, her and I on the phone, her name's Tasha O'Neill. She and I spent tons of time on the phone just chatting about Princeton, what it was like growing up there. Maybe we knew each other. I think my mother and her knew each other. 
And uh, they definitely do now, obviously. But um, I, I told Dylan, you know, this film means a lot more to me than it did when I first came on. And I would love, love, love if you gave me the opportunity to run with this and turn this film into not just, you know, some documentary that, you know, gets out there and has a very small reach and has, you know, just very simple interviews with a bunch of unique people, but that we really go into who is the drug killer, you know, what is the background of this man? I've now created a relationship with the entire family. They're allowing me to go into their archives. They're allowing me to go around the country to go to the Smithsonian and, and go underneath their name and, and, and see what's there. And it became this just enormous labor of love um, and a passion project I never saw coming and turned into a film that became way, way, way more than we had originally anticipated. And we ended up really doing the tribute to Jerry that I think was supposed to be done. And uh, we were fortunate enough to also partner with the studio in Santa Monica called uh, Subtractive Inc., uh, led by Kyle Schember and Ryan Stite. Ryan Stite ended up being the editor and director of the film. And they were wonderful and opening doors for us as well. And without their expertise and art artistic talents, we would not have had not just a really uh, interesting film, but a really fun film. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And the material and even, you know, just the ideas and the footage and everything else was so really well built overall. And kudos to you. And especially, you know, some of these ideas that you start with, you know, where you start exposing some of his ideas, starting from the particle physics stuff to then going on into space settlements and, you know, the O'Neill cylinders and things like that. They're all really uh, an interesting bunch of ideas that have uh, come about. But, you know, one of the things that struck me is that to this day, I mean, I'm in, embedded in the space world for the last 15 years, although I'm not from the US, but I've done a lot of work between India and, and Europe, for example, right? But I never really came across, uh, you know, Jared O'Neill until this point of time uh, and his ideas, you know, this. And you really mentioned it very well that, you know, his work on particle physics or even the space settlement is not well uh, acknowledged uh, by, by this particular community. And, you know, why, what is it that makes it now the timing to expose all of this? I mean, why is it that you think that people have not really built all of these things? Because... I mean, there was a lot of the, all of this orphans of the Apollo and, you know, all of these other documentaries that I've seen, which are very niche as well. You know, they talk about all of these people who are from that generation of the Apollo in the US who were really let down with those ideas that they had. And, you know, so they went on to try to commercialize Mir and, you know, so many other things, right? But it's taken a while for, you know, Jerry's ideas to be exposed in the way that you are. Yeah. Well, I think it's because it's finally happening. You know, um, and, and I think that if we today did not have private space entrepreneurs such as um, in, in America, you know, obviously we have Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and then Richard Branson in, in Europe. And I, I think with with people like that who are now paving the way in the private sector and using their private financial gains to build that heavy lifting infrastructure to go to space. If that wasn't happening, I don't think we ever would have heard about Gerard O'Neill in the way that people are hearing about him now. And we probably would not have made the film. I don't think that we, I, and we got lucky making this at the right time. I, Dylan always says that the, the, the moment he realized he needed to make the film, when SpaceX finally landed the dual um, boosters, um, and I think that was in Cape Canaveral, but I, I could be wrong. Um, uh, and that moment he said, you know, this is happening. We got to make this movie because we have to credit the man who came up with this. Um and so, um, you know, I, I think that it's hard to say why people don't know him. Um, I, you mentioned right before we got on that, you know, there's this whole idea of, you know, people know Carl Sagan. Why don't people know Gerard K. O'Neill? And, you know, I think actually Gerard's son says it best. Edward says it. I forget the exact quote, but he says something to the effect of, you know, he had the ideas. He had the math. He knew how to build the, the corporate structure. Um, and he was a born businessman and creative thinker. Um, the problem was he didn't want the massive financial gains that would have come from, uh, you know, maybe corporatizing his space colonies and whatnot. Um, and so I, I think actually to answer the question, I may need to, for your listeners, just explain um, what his ideas were um, for, for in, in, in the book he wrote. So it all started at Princeton he was speaking to a small, a select few, um, uh, you know, uh, 
top of the 1% of the class physics students, um, put them together and said, hey, I, I got these questions for you. I want you to work on. These are just ideas I'm also working on as well. One of those questions was, is the surface of a planet the right place for an expanding technological civilization? Um, and they all anticipated that the answer would be no. The best place will be on the surface of a planet. We should be terraforming Mars, the moon, wherever we want to go. And, and that was obviously the best idea. However, they went to first principle of physics and first principles of business and learned that the answer was, um, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, I got this backwards. But the answer was actually no, that we should not be building on the surface of a planet. We could, but the best place to do it would be in free space. And there were places called the Lagrangian points, the most popular of those being L4 and L5. And then, of course, created the L5 Society later on. But the L4 and L5 were these very optimal places to put um, what we now call today's space colonies. And he had his own version of that, which was called the O'Neill Cylinder. And why the Laryngian points were so important, um, and your listeners probably already know this, is that these are stable gravi gravitational points between the Earth and the Moon. Um, and this allows us to put something in space at a point, and it will stay at that point, and we will have virtually no gravity to have to work with. Um, we can create our, create our own inside manufactured space colonies. And he had his own concept. Gerard has, had his own concept called the O'Neill Cylinder. Um, it was this rotating cylinder, like a big, long pill in a way. Um, and typically, they'd be built in twos, and they'd be connected by these thin structures that would allow you to travel from one to the other. Um, and they would spin at a round, I think it was two revolutions a minute or, a, or, or once every two minutes. I'm, I, I need to check that. But it would allow us to create one G gravity, what we have here on the Earth. And inside he created and, and he went very public with this very quickly, which were these images that he would put in newspapers and his book, The High Frontier, which was basically the answer to that question he asked those students. Uh, which which started this movement. But the, the images that people saw, they said, oh my God, we can go into space and it's not going to be a shell. We're not going to be living in some chrome shell. It's, it's not going to be futuristic in the way that I don't want it to be. It's going to be like home. Um, it's going to look like, you know, he loved the upper peninsula of San Francisco and he wanted it to look almost like that Sausalito Bay area. And so a lot of the images look like that. They're very picturesque with lakes and bridges and, and vistas and long, you know, communities where people could live with lots of outdoor space and animals and trees. And he was very clear when he spoke about it that this would take some time. And that inspired a whole range of people, obviously. But then the next step was proving that it could be done. And that went along with getting a lot of the, the young people who had nothing to do with the space industry to join that effort and to help spread that word. He, he had a hard time convincing NASA at first. Obviously, it was a very, very, very expensive project, but they realized later on that it would have solved a lot of problems, especially energy. But he, what, what he did was he went out and showed that you did not have to be from government. You do not need to be from the military. You do not need to be a scientist. You can be an anybody and help me prove to the government that we can do this and that we should do this. And there was a, there was a little bit of like a, like a marching band behind him pretty quickly. They grew very fast. And it was proving that, you know, we had these limits to growth on earth, be it energy, population, resources, land area, um, and, and so forth. And he realized if we took heavy, uh, we took industry and put it in space and did it financially responsibly, we could replicate these colonies. And then we'd have our heavy lift, uh, we would have our industry in space and we could allow earth to be almost more of a playground. Um, and, and I'm speaking in superlatives here. Obviously, there would be industry here as well. But the idea was that we could go off into space and do something profoundly important for the human race so that we didn't hit a limit to growth on Earth. Um, and people lined up to do this. People dropped their jobs to help him. He had thousands and thousands of followers. Um, and he was a really smart communicator, the way he spoke to people about it. Um, and he, he did it in a numerous, uh, in basically the best way you could without the internet. You know, he had newsletters. He went to co every conference he could. He learned to fly his own plane so that he could travel more. Um, and by doing that, he was getting out there. And, and in his time, people said he was as popular as Steve Jobs. Um, however, 
Um, I have a hard time believing that people are going to forget Steve Jobs for a while. <laughs> and unfortunately, people have forgotten about Gerard O'Neill, which is why we made this film. And so I hope I'm answering the question the best way possible. But I think the core of your question really was why didn't we know about him and why are we learning about him now? And it's because he predicted something and inspired a movement of people. And those people, after he passed in, in the early 90s, promised to continue that, that road. And they are finally at the, at the beginning of the end of that road of building that heavy lifting infrastructure to go to space and do it financially responsibly. And um, so here we are, and it's basically, you know, how could we not do it and now suddenly say, here's the, here's the Jerry O'Neill flag, we're putting it in the ground, everybody look at it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. In fact, um, I'll tell you another story from actually from India because uh, I have a friend who researched on uh, one of the early rocket experimenters who was from India uh, in the 1930s. So he was brought to light only a, a couple of years ago because, you know, nobody really cared about documenting who was experimenting in rockets. And mostly it was, you know, all the Western rocket inventors that were experimenting on all of these in the 1910s and 20s uh, at the end. And, you know, this historian friend of mine, he actually researched on one of them and he brought to light this rocket pioneer uh, who was doing these experiments. And his thesis was that he's, you know, looking at either having to transport male or animals <laughs> from one part or the other, especially for disasters or, you know, even for transporting mail from one city to the other. And that's the case that he was experimenting with rockets for, right? So you have all of these crazy news stories coming up, but, you know, this is on, when you look at East, it's a whole new dimension, you know, from the West at the end. But again, you know, with uh, Jar O'Neill as well, it's again, super interesting that all of his kind of ideas were something that would have been extremely well received perhaps at this point of time, maybe even extremely well funded because, you know, venture capital at that point of time may not have been existing, right? At that uh, moment in time when he was doing all of these things, right? So it's just that I guess a lot of these ideas that he had were just too ahead of his times. Yeah. And, you know, you're kind of hitting on something there, which was that, you know, I think in his time, Jerry, and by the way, many people who knew him called him Jerry. Um, uh, Jerry was, Jerry would have been, I think, uh, a, a venture capitalist in a way. <laughs> I think he would have um, created enormous financial gain had he wanted it. And I, I, when I spoke with his, his widow, Tasha, she said, you know, they didn't want that, that, that wealth. They didn't want it. Um, and I absolutely respect that. And I think that, you know, it, it made Jerry and Tasha happier people and not having to deal with enormous wealth. Um, however, I do think that the way Jerry thought was the way that the, the, you know, crazy way ahead futurist thinkers think. I mean, he wrote an entire book called 2081, which predicted what the world would be like in a hundred years from 1981. And believe it or not, to the year, he's getting things right today. You know, he predicted the use of Tesla, of, of self-driving uh, cars the way Tesla does and how credit cards would work, how bank cards would work. The fact that we would have something called Kindle and he even drew it and it looks just like Kindle, you know? Um, and, and I think that because he didn't want that wealth, he didn't get to the point where you would say that, you know, Elon Musk had a, had a point in his career where he said, okay, am I going to take the wealth I've, I've gained from PayPal and go and use it? And he said, yes. Um, unfortunately, Jerry, one, didn't receive that wealth and didn't get the opportunity to say, what do I want to do with that wealth? Because we'd spoken about this earlier, but not just, you know, he solved a major, major issue in high energy physics when he was gosh, 10 years younger than I am. You know, he was in his early 20s. And when he was towards the end of his life, he was working on a project called Geostar, which was the um, basically what we use now in uh, air traffic control to track planes so that they don't crash. There was a crash, um, I think it was in the mid 80s. I, I could be getting the date wrong here, but there was a crash where a huge airliner and a private plane crashed on a beautiful day in San Diego and they should have seen each other um, and they didn't. And he said, something has to be done. He was a pilot himself and he, I'm sure he was thinking about his own well-being. 
but he ended up inventing what became GPS. Um, and there's not something that we use universally on Earth more than GPS. Um, and if you create something like, I mean, think about it. If Cherry had invented GPS and had somehow monetized it, we would not have to be, you know, saying who's Jerry. We would know who Jerry was because he'd be out in space and O'Neill cylinders would be in space and this would all be happening a lot sooner. However, I think, you know, we're here for a reason at this time. Um, and it's just crazy to think that he he isn't that sort of Elon Musk figure or or, or Steve Jobs figure or, 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 or who else, you know. Yeah, and absolutely. And in fact, you know, that's the critical piece in, uh, you know, that many others are getting it right almost today, right? Because people like Jeff Bezos, who is also featured in this particular documentary, talks about getting a lot of inspiration and you ultimately are in a place where people have made a lot of wealth and they're now spending it in space. But a lot of these people have been inspired by, you know, Gerard O'Dean's ideas at the end. Given that, you know, Dylan Taylor and I also saw that uh, Rick Tomlinson was also featured in it and he was talking about, you know, how uh, his ideas came about and how he was influenced by, uh, you know, Gerard O'Neill's ideas as well and you know, same with Jeff Bezos and others. Mm -hmm. so, do you believe that there's a lot of critical mass of thinkers that are in, you know, pretty reasonably well-placed positions today that are taking inspiration from the, these ideas and now they've enough going on for them to fund some of these ideas. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and you mentioned Jeff Bezos, and obviously there's, um, you know, uh, so much in the ether to be said about the way Jeff Bezos has gotten to where he is, but also what's happening at Blue Origin. And, and um, I think the future still is bright for, for Blue Origin. I think, if, 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 you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of what they do because when Jeff graduated from Princeton, albeit, <laughs> he had read The High Frontier several times by then, and he quoted it. The legend goes was that he quoted The High Frontier in his a valedictorian speech at Princeton when he graduated, um, which is where Jerry taught. Um, and he quoted Jerry and The High Frontier multiple times in that speech. And in that speech, he mentioned that I'm going to go off and do a whole bunch of things. I'm going to go and try and make a whole bunch of money if I can. And if I do... It's all going to be because I want to go and build this heavy lifting infrastructure, go to space and hopefully build to pave the way for this Jerry O'Neill world um, to get these colonies in space and, 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 and to see Jerry's vision come true. Um, and lo and behold, he became <laughs> the, the richest person in the entire world and is now doing exactly that. And so there's a lot of people like him. You know, you know Rick Tomlinson is one of the uh, associate producers of the film. As well, I mean, you can. The list goes on. You know, Peter Peter Diamandis of the X Prize, uh, Jeff Manber of Nanoracks, Loretta Whitesides of at Virgin Galactic, and um, you know, I think uh, covertly Elon Musk would even say that he's probably read the book and he's been inspired by it. But you know, the list goes on and on and on, and we really did our best to highlight the best of the best that we could, um, and the people who knew him the best as well. But it is without doubt true that. You know, when Jerry released his book, The High Frontier in 1976, which was which was the answer to that question he asked those students that day and, and, and the proof and the math of how it can be done, it changed the course of the space industry. I know that from around that time, about 10 years later, we had the Challenger disaster. And then until, you know, the early 2000s, there was a, a, a heavy pause in space exploration. And I think that's because... NASA was hitting walls. NASA was struggling to, to, to get things done. And they also decided they needed to be a lot more careful because of the Challenger disaster. And, and obviously there's a ton of political, you know, activity behind all of, all of that as well. Um, that, that's totally valid. But during that time, when Jerry died in 1992, everyone turned back and said, you know what? Let's go off, do our own thing, find a way to make this reality because we're a bunch of you know, creatives and businessmen and businesswomen and, and just, and just thinkers. And Jerry is no longer our leader. We need to go out and be those leaders and, 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 and continue that legacy. And, you know, I, without Jerry and without the high frontier and without, you know, his movement, I don't think we would have 50% of what's happening in new space right now. I don't, I don't think we'd have that, especially in the United States, we would not have that. And uh, he's just he's just this bigger than life visionary leader that people say died too soon. I, I didn't get to meet him, but 
But I think that maybe his passing inspired the people um, who followed him to go off and, and make history in their own way. Um, and that may not have happened if he hadn't passed. I will say there's a really fun story that a bunch of the really tight knit people, people like Rick Tomlinson and Jeff, Jim Muncy, who works on Washington, who's also in the film, they all met at a bar in Princeton uh, not long after Jerry died. And they all, you know, raised a pint of beer or something and said that, you know, they would carry on his legacy. Um, and I think they really knew they all meant it that day because that's exactly what happened. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's it's totally super inspiring in all of this. Uh, one of the, again, interesting areas is um, an initial, let's say, tussle with NASA and, and Gerard O'Neill and his ideas taking a while to get traction and then his frustration with the whole NASA effort, right? And then eventual creation of the Space Studies Institute that you also capture in the documentary at the end. So one of the things that uh, really was interesting for me is this idea that, uh, you know, space agencies could do all the things and they are going to be leading. Uh, that was very predominant for a good chunk of time, perhaps for like 30 or 40 years at this point of time, starting from, you know, the Apollo landings to even the shuttle program and the others, right? So perhaps only now with Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, do you see any hope for, private space efforts to take that shape and to do it in a way that, you know, government agencies cannot possibly do it uh, at the end. In all of this, you know, the, the idea is that, you know, what was this nature of relationship that you see having evolved and having talked to, uh, you know, Tasha and others and their frustration in all of this and how did they, you know, overcome all of this? Because at the end, I also read that um, NASA was eventually giving him something like half a million dollars a year for his effort and his work. But he was just too frustrated with the bureaucracy and everything else. And then that's one of the reasons why he then founded SSI. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very glad you brought up SSI because um, that in a way was his, you know, his, it was his nonprofit that he created with Tasha to be the place for people to come together and, and work on these processes. Now, obviously what he wanted from the beginning was for NASA to just sign the check and say, you know, here's the money, make it happen because this makes a lot of sense. Um, and NASA just doesn't work that way. Almost no government body works that way. You're absolutely right. He did work with, he did a few studies with NASA. He would go in and basically give in-depth talks and research, uh, he would take off time from Princeton just to spend six months with NASA to work on some new project, trying to prove to them that this would work. And I think what NASA saw way down the pipeline was the use for putting infrastructure in space for the sole, not the sole purpose, but for the main purpose of creating solar energy. Um, and that was a big, big, big part of how this worked because he was making it very clear that if we went up there and we built structures, uh, solar power structures in space that were quite enormous, but as big as his, his cylinder or part of those cylinders. Um, and that was always the goal was that the solar power would power the cylinder and that that cylinder and, and, and solar array would beam energy down to Earth in the form of microwaves or, or, or another way, but particularly microwaves. Um, if, if we did that, it would be one heck of a financial recuperation on the government's part. We would make our money back pretty quickly if we did it right and it wasn't a loss. And then we'd have a way to get endless energy 24 seven from the sun for the entire earth. And that would change the energy industry. And we all know that the energy industry basically runs everything in the world. And uh, so, yeah, at the beginning, it was, okay, come to us and prove us that this can be done. There was really no new physics or technology needed to be invented to get this to work. There were one or two things along the way that he had to sort of prove things like um, something called the mass driver, which was basically this, this uh, electromagnetic cannon that would shoot resources from the surface of the moon out into space. So they would be caught and, and, and turned into the elements that we needed, things like nickel, iron, aluminum, oxygen, hydrogen, um, to build space settlements. And so he needed to prove that to them. And he was hitting wall after wall after wall. And I know that he not covertly worked with a lot of the people in Washington on the side, trying to trying to convince everybody that this was a worthy 
venture, that this was something we needed. To, we had the billions and billions of dollars to spend on Apollo. Let's do it in an intelligent way. And I do know, and we highlight this in the film, was that when the High Frontier was released, it obviously got the buzz going of how can we get this done? And then NASA came up with the concept of the space shuttle. And the space shuttle, for all intents and purposes, was a bus that would fly to and from space 50 times a year and would bring the cost down to, I think it was something like $100 a pound. And when you think about that, that may sound like a lot to you and me, but when you think about that, for a government body, especially the American government budget, we can go and do this. We can go out into space and get this done. So the major frustration was we have an answer of how to make humanity better, how to grow as a humanity, how to go out into space and answer all of these questions, but also do it in a, in a smart business way to get manufacturing and, and uh, you know, uh, solar energy creation out into space and all of that. We have it. And NASA just kept coming down and saying, no, no, no. And then at times it would be yes, yes, yes. And then right when they needed it to work, something would happen. Um, and there was a, a famous uh, moment, and I'm blanking on the, the gentleman's name at the moment, but he was a Republican senator who very publicly said on 60 Minutes that this was an enormous waste of money and time. And it was a pipe dream. It was just, it was science fiction. And then very soon after that, there was the Challenger disaster. And it was basically, de- Jerry's ideas were basically dead in the water. Um, and so around that time, he created the Space Studies Institute, which allowed him to accept money from investors and not have it go through the, the university and fund the projects to prove, and this is when he built the mass driver and, and, and he started Geostar and all that sort of um, technology, was to prove that NASA should do this. And just unfortunately, it, it, during his lifetime, it never came to fruition. Now, private space entrepreneurs don't really have the political hoops that they have to jump through. There's obviously a lot of politics behind that. There's a lot of treaties and agreements that if we didn't have, they could not do it. I mean, if, if there are uh, space act, act agreements in around the world and in America that if Jerry and his team didn't fight for to get passed uh, through, through our government, we uh, SpaceX could not be doing anything. Blue Origin couldn't do anything. You know, the, the UAE couldn't be doing anything. China, India, nobody could be doing anything. And because of those agreements, they are allowed to go and do that. And it just took someone with the right timing, with the right amount of financial capital, with the right ideas and the right drive. And, you know, uh, well, to do it. And, you know, recently Elon Musk said something to the effect of if we don't act with an insane amount of urgency, this isn't going to happen. Because things change so quickly in politics, in, 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 in war even just in terms of environmental issues, things happen so quickly that if we don't get out there and do this now, things could die. And who knows, you know, if Elon Musk were to pass or Jeff Bezos were to pass or any of the leaders of any international or any national space organization were to pass, who is a leader in their movement, that would halt a lot of programs. And so he's acting with an immediate sense of urgency. And I highly encourage everybody else to do the same because Jerry tried and he hit so many walls that that urgency just really kind of came to a halt. Yeah, and absolutely. This is also, a, you know, in part a cultural change perspective to all of this because what, you know, NASA was doing perhaps in the late 80s or even, you know, 70s and 80s is was this backlash against uh, industry doing many things and they having to control a lot of these things, right? The brand and the institution and the protection that the institution wants to have that you can see in many parts of the world with many space agencies as well. Uh, and it's taken maybe 30 years for NASA to come up and say, we will actually support entrepreneurs uh, in you know, essentially having them to take the risk and we being the customer at the end, rather than you know, we will do everything else uh, uh, and you, know, you just be the subcontractor to us. And that's a very big cultural change and it's taken probably 30 years for things to happen in the U.S. for it, and it's not happened in you know in many other parts of the world in that sense. Many other parts of the world, you know, where I come from, from India, it's really we're still in the '70s phase of where the U.S. was in that sense, and you're still we're still realizing that you know the 
the state doesn't need to go to everything and and there could be entrepreneurs who could do a lot of the things if the state would act then as a primary customer and not you know subcontract and use just industry as sweatshops to you know get things done at the end right so this is a large part of it and unfortunately cultural change uh, takes uh, a lot of time it does it really does and and i i feel fortunate to be in a country that's realizing that that it has something really wonderful which is private private space entrepreneurs and not saying one not shutting them down and two not saying we won't work with them but but are taking that other option saying you guys can continue to do what you do under the agreements that we've set with you and we will we will buy rides from you basically and what's even nicer too is that other countries are allowed to buy rides you know and that i think is really 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 powerful because if america were to say okay cool spacex that's nice you can do what you're doing we'll use you guys for our rides we'll you know subcontract your boosters but uh india is not allowed to you know what i mean um and, and as far as i understand that's not the case they're allowed to and i think that's very very humanistic and powerful and i'm very happy to be there that said i don't think that i think we're moving towards a future that you know I, I think growing up, and I'm sure you may share this experience, growing up, watching the Apollo project, watching uh, other other countries working on their space programs as well, it, it all feels national. And I've always been an advocate of breaking past national boundaries and creating Earth like one Earth. And that's a very you know beautiful and peaceful way of looking at things, but there are realities. However, I, I really do hope that we move towards a situation where there's no longer nations running their own space programs, but that we're working with companies. Do you know what I mean? And that SpaceX is, isn't just an American company. It started in America, but everybody uses it. Um, and, you know, I also know that there's, you know, America is very well known for its capitalist structure and its consumer market. Um, and I also hope that we don't, you know, we aren't controlled by one rocket company. I hope that there's a way to at least set some boundaries be- before these private space entrepreneurs get too powerful beyond and and, and move beyond what a government can even uh, control them to do and not do. Um, and I think we're actually very close to them moving beyond that, um, which is a little bit frightening to me at times. But I also believe that, you know, it, it, so far, these are companies building opportunities for people. And I hope that's all they really continue to do. Um, and not just for America, but for every country around the world. And I, I hope the cost come down, comes down so that com- countries that can't afford it can utilize it. I, I, I can think of a million ways that the boosters on, for, from SpaceX could be used for just humanitarian efforts by countries that at the moment can't afford it. And uh, I, I hope that that becomes an opportunity for them. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I did want to bring up uh, maybe something that is dicey, which is, you know, what do you think, you know, Gerard O'Neill would have experienced having run through all the material that you have in producing this at the end of his career or even the end of his life? Because I would say it was perhaps a very bleak time between the transition between, you know, the, you know, shuttle going wrong and then things going south and, you know, maybe funding being pulled out and many other things, right? So because at the end, you have this peak with the Apollo era. And then after that, maybe a little bit of shuttle and then everything kind of coming down. Uh, The trajectory is really downward, right? So do you think that, you know, at the end of his career, at least, you know, mentally he felt like down and out? Or is there anything that, you know, Tasha or others have shared? You know, um, I do know that one of the things we got to do in the making of the film was to see a lot more material than ever made the cut. I mean, the original cut of the film was something like three hours long. (laughs) Um, And the film is only now, I think, an hour and like 28 minutes or something. Um, And, you know, I got to read, you know, his unpublished autobiography that he wrote. Um, I got to read a lot of the letters he wrote back and forth with his family. And, you know, I, the, I never asked Tasha directly that question because I kind of already knew the answer, but I also hope that if they're listening to this, that, that this is the answer. And if I'm wrong, let me know, because I think that, you know, in, in his final days, weeks, months, and years, he was very optimistic about the future. 
and was working every single day, even while he was in his hospital bed, to not just leave a legacy for himself, but to leave, leave opportunities for people that worked with him. And a lot of people didn't know that he was sick until his dying, I'd say, year, maybe, because he kept it so private, but also because he was working so darn hard to get these things to happen. Mm -hmm. I think he was a little bit disappointed. I know he was disappointed from reading what he wrote. He was certainly disappointed by what was happening and was more upset with the way major government programs worked, especially after a disaster such as the Challenger disaster, but was also a human and realized that, that there were realities to how major programs would work. I do think, though, that he was a little bit more positive than I anticipated, in a way. I think he knew that this was going to happen. He truly, truly, truly believed it beyond a reasonable doubt that this was going to happen, that we would someday get to the point where people were making it happen. And I don't think he, I think he did realize, but maybe never articulated it um, beyond simply saying the words people. But I think he knew that the people, and in America, and you may already know this, but in America, the term people means something more than just, you know, humans. It means the people, we the people, we the people who are, who are the citizens of the country and not necessarily, but also including the government, but the people would bring in and make it happen. Um, and I, I think he sort of predicted that people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and all the people in the news space industry, I don't mean to just highlight those two, are making it happen. So I, I, I certainly know that he was sad he would miss these things. But I also know that I, I got to read his day planner that was leading up to the final days of his life. And he was scheduling meetings for that week. He wasn't stopping. Um, and he truly believed that there was no stopping this movement. And I think he, yes, would have been upset that there was almost a 25-year gap of nothing happening. Maybe a little bit less than that. I guess from, the, from, from Challenger to things really getting moving, it was about 20 years. He would have been a little bit upset about that, I think. But I also know that he, he probably believed that there's a, a good reason. And there was a lot to be learned. You know, uh, people say that the Apollo project failed because they tried to go too far too fast. And people are saying similar things about Elon Musk's moon, uh, uh, Mars project is that it's too far too fast. You don't want to go so far and achieve this big thing. And then where are you going to be at that point? Is Elon Musk even going to be still be alive? Is the, is the leadership going to be there? And are we just going to have some sort of ticket tape parade and say, okay, cool, we did it. Now what? We want to build step by step by step by step and not skip any steps along the way so that we can continue this journey. Um, and I'd say, I think that Frank White, who's also in the movie and is one of our associate producers, he's the author of The Overview Effect, said it best, which is that I think he uh, he would be delighted, you know, that he would be light, delighted and he is sure that he's missed it in a way. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that. So where can people catch The High Frontier? Uh, you know, I saw that uh, you have it up on Apple TV and a few other places. So is it restricted to the U.S.? Is it available everywhere around the world? Where can people catch it? Sure. Yeah. So it's an evolving uh, geographical issue at the moment. I know that, you know, for Apple TV, I think there are um, certain geographical uh, locks. However, I, the best places to find it right now are Apple TV. Um, and then if you are international, we will be having Blu-ray and DVDs available. Those will actually be available from major retailers, by the 1st of September, 2021. And then I believe they'll be available on Amazon on September 14th of 2021. We are also, if you have these apps as well, we will be, we are on Google Play, uh, Microsoft Stream, Vudu, Fandango Now. Um, and then we are supposed to be on Amazon soon. If your listeners don't know, there was a little bit of an issue with Amazon's documentaries, you know, with the, with the, with the transition out of the last um, presidency, uh, the Trump presidency. Um, so the documentaries were actually shut down. Um, so once that opens back up, which I hope will be soon, the High Frontier will be live on there. We just don't have a date for that at the moment. Um, you can also find out any information about the the film. And we also had a companion book written by the executive producer, Dylan Taylor, called Humanizing Space. Um, and that's really the full story of Jerry O'Neill from his childhood on through his passing. 
Um, and we are doing special edition movie copies of that book, The High Frontier, that Jerry wrote. Um, those are available on, on our site as well. Um, the website is thehighfrontiermovie.com. Um, and we also have merch available at highfrontiermerch.com. And that's actually where the, the book, The High Frontier, is available as well. But uh, yeah, and then you can find us on all uh, social media platforms at High Frontier Doc. And yeah, those are all the best places. Yeah, thank you for that. And also, I think I definitely recommend all the three books that he's written as well, starting from The High Frontier, Human Colonies in Space, and then 2081, A Hopeful View for the Human Future. Um, I mean, that's also a really interesting an exercise in future, futurology. And then uh, there's also The Technological Edge uh, where he argues for like six different technology sectors that the U.S. Uh, should develop that includes uh, robotics, you know, genetic engineering, uh, aircrafts and space science and others. I mean, these are really interesting books that complement, uh, you know, all the thought process behind this, his thinking and so on. And I think that, you know, probably is one of the most very well-rounded thinkers that I've come across now you know, having watched the documentary and having seen some of his writings and so on. It's a very, very well thought out and, you know, very much grounded in pot potential possibilities in physics and in science to be then, you know, uh, built out in a way where you can establish every step along the way. And it's not really somebody who is just saying, oh, this will happen, but you're, it's actually somebody who can tell you how do you get there by doing you know, one step after step after step. And that's something that is really fascinating. And there's not many people in the world that who have built, you know, such sort of, of a thought process and have actually, you know, put it in a way that people can easily connect with. You know, that's my, uh, having gone through some of those material that was really distinctly appearing to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you said it really well. That's exactly the way he's, he, he, he wrote, he thought, he spoke. Um, he was a practical guy who knew how things worked and was not just a big thinker, but a mathematician and physicist that could prove that things could be done a certain way. Um, I highly recommend those books. Um, and, you know, 2081, I personally, that's one of, that's one of my favorite books. I think it's just wonderful. However, uh, The High Frontier, Human Colon Colonies in Space is just, that is a, a, a life-changing book. It changed the industry, especially here in America. And if anyone who's listening right now doesn't have the time to even see the movie, read the book. That The book will change the way you think about space forever. Um, and it's one of those books and authors that when you open up that book and you open up the mind of the author, you realize this is something that's going to change fundamentally how I think about humanity. Um, so I highly recommend that book. Absolutely. So final question, Will. So thank you so much for taking the time and also sharing the documentary with me. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I definitely recommend all the listeners to go check it out as well. Have you caught the space bug and you want to know more of space? <laughs> it's, that's a great question. And it's funny too. And I didn't say this before, which is that I, before this film, I was a filmmaker, but I was not a space guy. I was brought on this as a really like a logistical producer. And then yeah, I caught the space bug, man. I, <laughs> I actually ended up um, helping the executive producer, Dylan Taylor, who um, is the uh, founder of Voyager Space Holdings. He and I launched a company called Multiverse Media, which, which is a space media uh, company that, that focuses on space exploration, science, technology, and medicine. And uh, yeah, I, I certainly caught it. Um, I, I'm not yet sure what my next documentary is going to be, but there's a few floating around right now that we are um, kind of working on together. We're actually talking with NASA right now to potentially do a eight part TV series about the overview effect, which was, you know, the, the cognitive shift astronauts have when they go to space that we're trying to bring down to earth and to bring to everybody around the world. Um, and that's, that's the product of lowering the cost of space. If you can lower the cost, people can go and have that cognitive shift. And so we're doing a, a series with them right now. Um, and then there's a few other little projects that we're kind of mulling out the moment too. But yeah, I certainly caught the space bug and I don't think I'll ever change. Absolutely. I mean, I would definitely look forward to, you know, staying in touch with you and definitely look forward to any of the other work that you'll be involved in as well. Uh, it's one of the most uh, well-produced, you know, overall very, very well-rounded and well-made uh, documentary I've watched and I've watched a fair number of space documentaries, <laughs> having been in the sector thank for you. a long time as well now. So thank you for, you know, all the efforts. And it's been really a pleasure knowing your work and, uh, and the documentary itself. 
And yeah, I look forward to keeping in touch and uh, thank you for coming on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me.